If you look at Philippians 1.8, it says, For God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. God is our record. When you live for God, you might find yourself defending yourself against people slandering your name. But really, you don't have to because God is your record. Just like God knows all the bad things we do, He also knows the good things. Here are some things that God kept record of about Paul. God kept record, record of how Paul greatly longed after the Philippians in the bowels of Jesus Christ. This is a good sign that you are a born-again believer if you are longing for being around other Christians and have a love for being in fellowship with them. In 1 John 3.14 it says, We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Paul greatly longs for them in the bowels of Jesus Christ. The bowels would be the inside, the inside of a person. And the love of Jesus Christ can be shown through us to other Christians. Not only this, but God keeps record of each time we pray. If you look at verse 9, it says, And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. Paul is constantly praying. Before we mentioned earlier about he was thanking God upon every remembrance of the Philippians. If you search the word words prayer, pray, and praying in the Pauline epistles, you will see that Paul stayed on his knees constantly. He is praying for the love of these Christians to abound more and more in all judgment. Today the love of Christians is resembling the love of the lost people in the tribulation because it is waxing cold. The Bible says, referring to the tribulation, the love of many shall wax cold. And in the body of Christ, there are many backstabbers and troublemakers. Paul says that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. He mentions knowledge because the more you know about God, the more you can love God. The more you read the Bible, the more you know about God. He mentions judgment because judgment has to be involved in love. We have judged the Christ of other religions as a false Christ because they believe he is just some good man or a good prophet. We believe the Bible teaches he is God manifest in the flesh. We love the Jesus Christ described in scripture. We had to have judgment to figure out which one was right and which one to love. And God keeps record of our love for other Christians, our time spent in prayer, and he also keeps record of things we approve. If you look at verse 10, it says that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. As Christians, we have to watch what we approve. At times, it may seem like we are against everything. If you have been saved and serving God very long, then people have probably said to you many times the phrase, What are you not against? And there is a guy named Antipas in the book of Revelation, and his name means against everything. But the Bible also calls him a faithful martyr. And Christians are persecuted and killed not just for preaching the Bible, but because of they're against so much. Men don't like for you to disapprove of their sinful lifestyle. And the Bible sheds light on their sins and sinful lifestyle and that is why they want rid of the scriptures. That's why they become atheists and Bible correctors. So we need to approve things that are excellent. And what is excellent according to the scriptures. In Psalms 8.1 it says, o, o Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Who has set thy glory above the heavens. And then Job 37.23 says, Touching the Almighty, we cannot find him out. He is excellent in power and in judgment and in plenty of justice he will not afflict so God Almighty and his name are excellent what do we need to approve things that are for the God of the Bible anything against God and his word we should disapprove what else should God be recording about us in heaven he should be recording that we are bearing fruit Philippians 1.11 says, Being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, and to the glory and praise of God. Here are the fruits of the Spirit. In Galatians 5.22 and 
these are more of an evidence of salvation than good things that you do outwardly. There's a lot of people that, of lost people that do good things outwardly. But Galatians 5.22 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Do you have love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance? Those are signs of salvation more than living right outwardly. The Pharisees lived right outwardly. So you can't judge someone on the inside by looking at stuff on the outside all the time. Although having the fruits of the Spirit should lead a person to living right on the outside. Salvation is spiritual and that is why you can't just always judge a man's salvation by looking on the outside. Paul says in verse 11, the fruits of righteousness are by Jesus Christ. Everything we do that is good is by Jesus Christ. Any fruit we produce is by Him. We can only take credit for the bad things that we do. Philippians 1.11 Being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory and praise of God. Next we see that God needs to have record of us giving Him the glory and giving Him the praise. And many times when men do things for God they are getting the glory. And they want the praise. How often do you watch preaching and you see a guy who is all dressed up and he has pride all over his face. And when he comes in to preach, he gets a huge introduction and the whole congregation claps and even whistles and gives him so much glory. But he's just another sinner. And any message or sermon he has, if it is any good at all, came from God and not from him. And sometimes watching preaching can make you sick because of the haughty spirit of man and their ego. And when talking to some big shot preachers, you can tell they have gotten a big head over being cheered for so many times. But Philippians 1.12 says, But I would not, or but I would, you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out, brethren, to the furtherance of the gospel. The gospel can spread more after something bad takes place in your life. It can spread even more. And Paul being in prison caused the gospel to spread more than it was spreading before. In Philippians 1, 13 and 14, he says that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. People were talking about Paul even more now. And many of the brethren in the Lord waxing confident by my bonds are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Word got around that Paul was in prison for preaching the gospel and caused many of the brethren to be more bold in preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. They saw the boldness of Paul and realized they could have just as much courage and boldness as he was having. His bonds, meaning his imprisonment, did more good for the gospel than the enemies of the gospel ever imagined that it would. And Philippians 1, 15 and 16 says, Some indeed preach Christ, even of envy and strife. There's those two words again. And some also of goodwill, the one preach Christ of contention. Notice that word, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my bonds. Some men were going around preaching Christ of envy, strife, and contention. This would add affliction to his bonds because men would think Paul was just like these smart aleck preachers which he wasn't. And men still do this today. When a preacher or a teacher preaches Christ of envy and strife, it makes it harder on the sound Bible teachers who are only trying to get people grounded in the word and win souls. And many times a preacher will get a hobby horse and he will spend all of his time on some subject that isn't even a deal breaker. And the man's following will get such a conviction about this topic that they will begin to say a man isn't even saved as we talked about before, if he disagrees with them on this topic. And examples of this, I said a few earlier, but more of, of them examples as subjects like people arguing over repentance and the flat earth versus the spear earth and house churches versus church buildings, post-trib rapture versus the pre-trib rapture. And the list goes on. These subjects have all been used to cause major 
division among Christians to where they can't stand each other and they hate each other. And these things should be preached about and taught on, but they have also been blown out of proportion and became a hobby horse for many. And it is to the point where many don't preach Christ of goodwill, they're preaching it of envy and strife and contention. And they are more about defending their beliefs on a certain topic to make themselves feel more spiritual than they really are. And, and they're about just causing envy and strife and division. And they will put up, they'll start fights over little things like this. And everyone that follows them will begin to hate everyone that disagrees. They have a lot of pride and they can't deal with disagreements. They can't get along with other Christians. They feel they are more spiritual because they believe this certain way. They preach Christ of envy and strife because, like I said, they like to start fights. And that is the reason they do a lot of preacher name dropping. Sure, Paul named names. It is necessary at times, but a lot of this name dropping is to draw attention to yourself. And who likes to draw attention to their self? Babies, little kids. And it's, it shows that they're carnal and babies like the Corinthians. These Bible teachers want to be the greatest. Sim similar to how the disciples felt in Mark 9:34, it says, they disputed among themselves who should be the greatest. They feel they have to call each other out and prove each other wrong so that they become more spiritual and more superior. The truth is, as Bible believers, we should be on the same team and help each other out and look over minor disagreements or at least deal with the disagreements and not try to destroy each other's ministry over them. And Philippians 1.17 says, But the other of love knowing that I am set for the defense of the gospel. So it says the other of love. And that shows the ones preaching Christ of contention were preaching with hate. They know Paul is set for the defense of the gospel. If I know a guy is winning souls and believes the King James Bible, who am I to try to step in and wreck his ministry? I would be fighting against the gospel instead of helping a man who is defending the gospel. And Philippians 1.18 says, What then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. Paul rejoices either way. No matter how a man is preaching Jesus Christ, Paul rejoices. Some men are really hateful and mean when they get behind a pulpit, but at least they are doing something. If they are preaching the gospel, we can at least rejoice in that fact. And many times a preacher gets his main inspiration from trying to disprove another one. If he is preaching the gospel while doing this, we can still rejoice in the fact the gospel is being preached. Even if we can't rejoice in the fact that he is constantly bashing his brother in Christ. Many street preachers who record themselves on the street, I'm sure you've seen videos of it, are preaching some bad doctrine and doing a lot of name calling. Calling... The lost people walking by whores and everything else, which that's what lost people are supposed to be. Whores and adulterers. That's what lost people do. They sin. They're bad sinners. There's no, you don't have to call them that. Uh, we can't rejoice in some of the things that we're doing, but we can rejoice in the fact that they are telling people and reminding people about Jesus Christ. Uh, Philippians 1.19 says, For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Paul's imprisonment helped out the prayer lives of many. Many times bad circumstances can get us and others closer to God. You may find yourself calling on God more in hard times than in good times. Paul says, For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer. And this isn't referring to Paul getting spiritual salvation through prayer, but Paul is referring to physical salvation, referring to him getting out of jail through the prayers of his brothers and sisters in Christ. And more examples of salvation, not meaning spiritual salvation, is in 1 Timothy 2.15 and 4.16. 
But Philippians 1.20 says, According to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. Paul says in Romans, For I am not, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Paul wasn't ashamed of his imprisonment, and that is because he was in prison for the right thing. He was in prison because he was magnifying the Lord Jesus Christ. And this brings us to another point. The Lord Jesus Christ can be magnified during hard times. He can even be magnified during the death of a saint. Notice Paul said, whether by life or by death. An example of Christ being magnified at the death of a saint is the lost people present at the funeral who might hear the gospel preached and get saved. That's just one example. But Paul was not afraid of death. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, it talks about Paul being caught up to the third heaven. He had seen something that other Christians hadn't seen, and he knew he would be gaining more in death than in life. And that is why he says in verse 21 through 24, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. For if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I will not. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. He knew he would be with Jesus Christ and walking on gold streets without any more pain or persecution if he died and went to heaven. He also knew there was still a lot of work to be done on earth, more saints to be edified, souls to be saved, and more purpose for him on the earth. It was needful for his converts for him to abide in the flesh. Paul saying, for me to live as Christ and to die as gain is proof against soul sleep. If he was going to die and be with Christ, then he wouldn't be asleep. Paul had his affection on things above, as he also commands us to have in Colossians 3 and verse 2. And if dying is gain, then you wouldn't be going to sleep. How would going to sleep and being unconscious be a gain? Philippians 1.25 says, And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith. I believe Paul knew he was going to get out of jail and not be martyred for the faith. Yet, just like in 2 Timothy 4.6, he knew the time of his departure was at hand. He was confident that God wasn't done with him in the ministry on earth. God may keep a saint on earth because they are helping saints go further in their Christian walk, service, and Bible study. And there are a lot of men who teach the Bible who bring me joy just by hearing them teach the words of God. And Philippians 1.26 says that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Jesus Christ for me by my coming to you again. Once again, I believe Paul knew he was getting out of jail and coming to see them again. And verse 27 says, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. Our conversation, as it talks about in verse 27, isn't just the way we talk. It is our conduct and manner of life. Paul wanted to know that whether he was coming to see them or absent from them, he would hear that they are striving together in the gospel of Jesus Christ. He wanted them to stand fast in one spirit and strive together in one mind. Paul wouldn't be happy with many Bible believers today. They aren't striving together. They are fighting against each other over stupid, non-deal-breaking doctrines instead of helping each other defend the gospel and the King James Bible. One of my favorite preachers, David Hoffman, preached a sermon called Nine Out of Ten Ain't Bad. And the sermon was about not getting bent out of shape and breaking fellowship over a few minor disagreements. I believe this is one of the most needful things to be preached to the body of Christ in the times we are in. And that is why I mention the subject so much. And Philippians 1.28 says, and, and nothing be terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. If you have trouble, suffering, and afflictions, it is a good sign that you are saved. If a man lives for God, then he will suffer persecution. 
John 15, 20 says, Remember the word that I said unto you, The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. 1 Thessalonians 3, 3 says, that No man should be moved by these afflictions. For yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. Christians are supposed to suffer. We are appointed to have afflictions if we stick up for the Lord Jesus Christ. And Philippians 1.29 says, For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Since you live in America, you may not be suffering like many Christians in the world who are being beheaded for the faith or tortured. You may be suffering in other ways. You may be a woman who has a husband that doesn't care about living a Christian life or the Bible. You may suffer persecution from your own family or co-workers for being a Bible believer. And Philippians 1.30 says, Having the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here to be in me. Notice Paul says, Having the same conflict you saw in me. Christians were getting the boldness to preach the gospel because of Paul's boldness and getting thrown in jail themselves. And we shouldn't seek to be persecuted or thrown in jail for the work of Jesus Christ. It is just something that comes along with being a Christian. But this has been Philippians chapter 1.